So uh, happy National Water Week. Uh, my name is Rachel O'Leary and I work for Waverley Council. And before we start, just a few housekeeping measures. Um, please continue to be on mute during this webinar. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat function. And uh, if you have any technical difficulties, of which we've had a few already this morning, sorry, um, please pop them in the chat. Uh, and then uh, Nicola Saltman, my colleague, who's been super helpful behind the scenes, can help resolve some of those with you in the chat. So Waverley Council would like to acknowledge the Bidigal and the Gadigal people who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast. We would like to acknowledge Aboriginal elders past and present. And I guess just to reflect that Aboriginal people have a deep respect and a deep knowledge uh, around water. And so it's a great opportunity for us to gather today together and learn more about caring for water. So I've just put the agenda for the webinar today. Uh, I'm just going to give it a brief overview. So Waverley Council is really committed to protecting the environment. We have an environmental action plan which outlines water saving targets for both council operations and also uh, for the community. Uh, and so I just looked it up this morning, but it, well, in 2016-17, our LGA consumed 6.75 billion litres of water in that year. So it's a lot of water and 80% of that water is used in the residential residential sector. And 80% of us live in apartments in Waverley uh, LGA. So we've got about 1600 apartment blocks of all shapes and sizes. So we thought a webinar on saving water was a good place to start. So the aim for today's session is to share knowledge on ways to save water in apartments and also to promote Sydney Water's Water Fix Strata program to our residents. Uh, we would love to support uh, all of you that live in apartments to check your water consumption of your building. Uh, and we can do that with Sydney Water and any high water users that are identified to get you involved in uh, Sydney Water's Water Fix for Strata program. So I'd like to introduce uh, our two speakers for this morning. Um, we have Tony Robinson from Sydney Water. Tony is a water efficiency specialist and he's been at Sydney Water for 20 years implementing water saving programs, water efficiency programs, and he heads up the team, the water fix team. So there's Tony saying hello. Um, and yeah, he has a plethora of knowledge on this topic. Uh, and he is also, we have Tonya Gibson with us today. And Tonya does a lot of the access and organisation around the Water Fix for Strata program. So if we have any questions about how that works, Tonya is available to answer those. So thank you, Tonya, for being here. And our second speaker is Christine Byrne. And Christine's been instrumental in, in improving the sustainability of strata buildings across the country. She started Green Smart Strata, a not-for-profit organisation that does both advocacy, so advocates for government uh, changes around sustainability in strata, but also educational uh, work. So she's educated hundreds of building managers and strata strata committees in terms of improving sustainability and she's made a real contribution to this sector so it's great to have Christine here today thanks so much for both of your time so before I pass over to Tony we just wanted to run a poll uh, just to see what kind of building apartment buildings what size apartment buildings that our participants in the webinar live in today so if I could get Nicola to share that and if you wanted to to put what, um, so it looks like, yeah, it's moving around a bit. We'll just give it another 10 seconds. So it looks like about a third are in the smaller sized apartment. So up to 10, 10 units in the apartment block. And then the next sector is 10 to 25 units. And we've definitely got some people in larger apartment blocks. So that's really wonderful. So thank you for doing that. And our next poll is just secondly, where do you think the most water is used inside an apartment? So if I could get Nick to launch that poll. Where do you think most water is used inside apartments? Looks like you guys already know a lot about water saving. 
you're all on the right track. Great, so the majority pick shower. So we'll let Tony enlighten us more, but I think you're well on the right track there. So Tony, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and let you share your screen. And if you want to unmute, that's great. You're still on mute, Tony. I am too, sorry. I took right. put the camera on and the left the microphone off. Sorry, could you put the slides up, please, Yes, Rachel? sure, yeah. share the Thank slides. You. Had a few technical difficulties with my Sydney water machine. Didn't like Zoom this morning, so I couldn't get on there. So we'll have to go through these slides on, on, on PDF. So, uh, yep, you could just go down to the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, where is water used in apartment buildings, um, how water works in apartments, and uh, then we're going to have a little ch ch chat about is your water uh, building efficient and how you can work that out for yourself. And then we'll talk at the end about how we can help City Water with our Water Fix Strata program. Next slide, please. So yes, as we the poll just suggested that, um, and most of you did get it right, that uh, seventy um, percent of eighty, sorry, seventy fifty one percent of um, water is used in in the showers. I can't quite see these slides very well; they're a bit small. I'll just move this over here so I can see it bigger. All right. So yeah, eighty six of um, percent of water in apartment buildings is actually used within the, the apartments themselves. And by a long margin, yeah, 51% is used in the showers, followed by um, leaks, which is about 7.7%, uh, and clothes that, um, washing, there is uh, leaks, sorry, 7%, toilet 7.7%, and uh, washing clothes 6.8% in washing machines. So these are pretty much averages, though. Um, we have found in some apartment buildings that leaks can be up to about 24% of that of usage in some buildings. So leaks is uh, also quite a big um, issue. Get this over. Next slide. So inside apartments, you know, what, where's the impact on consumption? So the big one here. The, as we've just spoke about, we've got toilets. Are they single flush or are they dual flush? What sort of taps have we got? Um, have we got just normal taps? We've got mixer taps, or we've got a combination of both mixers and um, standard taps. Dishwashers. Dishwashers don't quite use as much water as most people think. They actually quite a water efficient way to wash dishes, as long as you've got a full dishwasher when you run a cycle and you're not rinsing the plates or rinsing everything before you're putting it in, um, dishwashers are quite water efficient. Washing machines, so we've got your more efficient um, front loader type washing machines, five or six stars that use about 30 litres of water compared to your older top loader models, which could use up to 140 litres of water per load. So there's a big difference there. Um, and here we've got um, thermostatic mixing valves, which probably should be another consideration. We do have issues with um, the age of thermostatic mixing valves. Once they get to 10 years, about 10 years old, because that's basically the guaranteed life cycle of them, <clears throat> they start to fail and they fail to cold. So that people start complaining about, I've got no hot water, or it takes a long time for my hot water to come through it's normally the thermostatic mixing valve. And you'll find that they'll all start um, going at the same time. And the other thing there is also flexi hoses. So flexi hoses also have a, a lifespan of around 10 years. Um, once you get past that 10 years, they start to burst and leak and um, cause a lot of problems in apartment buildings with flooding, etc. So next slide here, it's not quite all on screen for me. Yep, next slide here <coughs> is just some of the end users. So we've got an old single flush toilet there on the right. Um, that would that toilet would be about 18 litres per flush compared to with a more modern five 
three and a half litre type, um, more efficient toilet. Over here on the left, you can see uh, it's an isolation valve actually behind a hot water service in a cupboard in the kitchen. And those Isle style um, isolation valves with a gland, packing gland in the top, they often leak and they, they, they cause obviously water usage, but also water damage. And again, we're showing at the top there, those flexi hoses. Now those flexi hoses there, they're screwed straight on to the uh, fittings in the wall. So there's no mini cistern taps or mini cock, mini cistern cocks, uh, mini taps, whatever you would like to call them. So they, so if they burst, then it's really hard to isolate. If you don't know where the isolation point in your unit is, it could be in the common area. We'll talk about isolation valves a little bit more in a minute. But if they burst, then there's no way to turn that off. So the water runs everywhere. So older style installations, they never fitted those mini system taps to each mixer or each tap, but um, more modern plumbing code is that they're all fitted. Next one, please, slide. So here, so looking at these shower heads, um, you know, which one's a water efficient shower, which one's not a water efficient shower. So by just looking at um, a shower head, you've got real no idea. You have to actually measure the flow rate so you understand if it's a water efficient shower or not. Um, so the, uh, the, the plain silver ones, like on the top right and on the left hand side margin, so they could be older style ones that are just full flow, 18, 20 litres a minute, or they could actually be a nine litre a minute shower. I like to call those Milo tins because they look a bit like a Milo tin. Um, but yeah, by just looking at them, you don't know until you, until, unless you test the um, flow rate. Next slide, please. So with taps, we have aerators. Um, and with aerators, it depends on the spout, whether you can fit an aerator or not. Um, most all mixer taps would have an aerator, but some older style tapware may not have aerators. They may just have a straight through spout. Don't see, we don't see quite as many of them uh, anymore, um, but we do come across them every now and then. So if it has an aerator or the aerator body, um, it's easily to make it water efficient by fitting in a water efficient aerator in it. Nine litres for kitchens and six and a half for hand basins. So I'm not sure how easy this people are gonna be able to see this graph. Um, it is a little bit small, uh, but here we're looking at leaks. And if you can, you can zoom in a little bit on those photos, you can see that the, um, the shower head's leaking, the toilet's leaking, and we've got a tap leak. So all these small leaks add up to quite a fair bit of leakage. So in this particular um, apartment building we've got here, there's uh, they're leaking at around 25 litres a minute, um, which is a, a quite, a, quite a significant cost over a, a, a year or a quarter. So leaks are a big problem and they can occur, occur, occur in other places such as in common areas, such as cooling towers. Pools can have leaks either in the body or in the pipework of the pools. Um, but yeah, leaks are a big thing. And having one of the, what we've got on this one, we've got a, uh, a SUMS data logger and having one of these um, loggers on your meter, which gives you um, 15 minute increments of water usage uh, it gives you a great idea of um, where you've got any problems in your building. So they're a good thing. They're a good investment, particularly for a larger building over a long term. So common area uses. So in common areas, there are um, lots of things to look at here. There's cold water storage tanks, uh, which are normally the gravity system at the top of the building. There's central hot water systems or boilers for hot water. There's cooling towers. There's grounds and gardens with irrigation systems, pools and spas, um, common area amenities like toilets and showers for pool areas um, or gyms. And then there's shared laundries and bathrooms. In, I don't see as many of those, but there are still in apartment buildings, older ones. 
and then there's cleaning and then there's fire testing. So we're just gonna talk a little bit more about some of those. So with cooling towers, cooling towers um, change the water. They do a water changeover when the total dissolved solids, the TDS, you can see there that it's at 282. Uh, when the TDS gets high in the cooling tower, it dumps all the water and then it replenishes the water in, in, in the cooling tower so that that because if the TDS gets too high, um, it starts corroding parts, et cetera, within, within the cooling towers. Most of these though are set very conservatively and they can easily be set at a higher rate. So this does waste a lot of water, but it also uses more chemicals to keep dumping the things. So the, I hope there's no people here that um, run cooling towers, but generally speaking, um, you know, it can be more cost effective to also have this TDS limit set in your controller a bit higher. Go to the next slide. The other thing with cooling towers, they have a, a makeup um, to keep them at a certain level. And often this, if you see the picture on the right, <coughs> it's like a ball valve, similar to what you have in a, a toilet system. Um, and they off, they'll fail, they, do, they all fail after, over time and they just run. And then what happens is it just directly continually bleeds and overflows to the sewer. So there's one, there's something you always need to keep good check on. The next thing uh, as a good one of mine, an irrigation system. I see a lot of irrigation system in a lot of buildings we've been in uh, have been disconnected. Um, irrigation systems are not uh, something that you install and then walk away from. Um, they're, they're quite actually quite high maintenance. Um, they're made, the plastic piping is not high quality um, and it often breaks and fails and um, it can be cause of a lot of excess water usage so over time. And then scheduling those, those the, um, irrigation systems correctly too is another big point. Um, a lot of um, uh, irrigation controls are set so you have to water twice a day, 20 minutes each station. I won't go into all the details, but um, they do waste a lot of water if they're not programmed and managed correctly, because you need to, in winter, you just turn them off basically. Even in an apartment building, you would actually just turn these off because they're, um, they're gonna be over watering. So pools. So pools are often uh, thought of as a bit of a villain. They can be if they've got a leak, um, but overall this one in this picture here, it's inside. So evaporation levels out of that are, are quite small, um, but even outside, it's only using the same amount of water as a, as a, a lawn would use. It's because it has that same type of evaporation weight. The thing to look at, if you look at that top picture there, this particular pool has an automatic top up. And again, similar to with the cooling tower, that these things fail as well. And they continue to run. And then the, if the pool set to automatically overflow when it gets to a certain height, then again, you do not see the water usage. Most pools do, people just have to put a hose in. And I can just, when, when, we're, when we're looking at buildings, we ask, well, how often do you need to top that pool up? And that's a great indication of whether that pool may or may not have a significant leak in it. But generally pools aren't quite as bad as, as most people think. So how does water work in the apartments? That's the next, that's the next part we're gonna talk about here. So for the first slide here, we've got, well, where does Sydney Water's responsibility start and end? And then where does the, the building take over. Well, Sydney Water own the main, as you can see down there on the left, we own the main and we own the meter, but we actually don't own that pipe between the main and the meter. That's actually the responsibility of the property owner. Often Sydney Water will help repair that for free if there is an issue, um, depending on exactly how far inside the property that issue is. So then everything outside of that water meter, again, that's the responsibility of 
in this case in the buildings. Do you want to go to the next one, please? So understanding your building's hydraulics. Hydraulics in the apart in apartment buildings is can be quite complex. Sometimes it's if it's a, a low rise up to about six stories, you may just use eight stories perhaps. You might just get away with using the, the pressure coming out of the Sydney water mains if you've got um, sufficient pressure in your area. So it's a understanding how it works though is a great starting point. So we have tanks, we've talked about hot water um, rooms or boilers, um, and then we may have a pump. We might, we might have a pump system that pressurizes, but then we might just have a pump that pumps it to the tank. And then we can have a whole lot of combinations of how that works in between. And this is, it's really important to understand that, um, particularly if you, you have breaks, you need to know where to turn things off. Um, but also you need to, the pressure in the building, hot compared to cold, and also overall pressure has a big um, bearing on the water efficiency of the building. Next slide. So here's a couple of examples of this. I'm not sure how well you're, everyone can see this, but on the, I'm just getting my, my version up here so I can see it a bit better. On the left-hand side, we've got right down the bottom, we've got the pressure coming in here, the water coming in at the bottom, and there's one that goes one branch off to the right that goes to fire testing. And we've got up here, and it's got the cold, wet, cold water is supplied by mains pressure for the first eight to nine levels of the building. Then the, the rest is pumped to the top. And then the water comes down from the top and it supplies the levels 10 to 24. Then there's, and also off that tank is pressurized for 25 to 35. So because there's not much um, head of pressure at the top of the tank, it also requires a pump to supply those cold and hot water systems at the top. And then there's a separate line gain, came coming off that top tank to pry, supply all the hot water for all the levels, all the way up from the ground to 24. So you've got a mix then of the water pressure coming from the tank for those, for the hot water, for those um, first four levels, and also you've just got mains pressure. So the water coming out of that tank, by the time it gets to that level can be much, could be, much higher than the pressure coming out of the main. So that's when you, we start getting problems with mixing. And again, there's just another example on the right-hand side. Again, it's, it's a mixture. It's a, it's a mixture of where the water comes from. So understanding how that works in, in a building can be quite um, critical. So with, with tapware, you can go to the next slide. Yep. So with tapware, the things we need, I'll talk about Tupperware again in a second, sorry. So how water works, we'll finish this slide first. Um, what you need to know about your system, you need to know how it works. Is it mains pressure? Is it pumped? If it's got a gravity heavy header tank, and as I showed in those previous two examples, combinations of all of them. Um, is it a single meter for the whole building or a more modern building are all individually metered with cold and hot water. And then isolation points, where are they? How many there are? Um, is it only the meter tap, um, et cetera? And then do you have a common service, a ring main maintained by the owner's corporation or individual hot water units in each apartment? So a lot of older apartments definitely have those. So isolation points. So on the left-hand side here, we've got a more modern building um, <clears throat> with a bank of gas hot water meters. So these are, Sydney Water don't bill you through these meters. These are what the gas company bill you through um, on your gas on your water usage, they that from the water usage, they work out your gas bill. Down the bottom there, you can just see normal little taps below that. That's the cold water isolation. There's no meters on there. 
meters could possibly fitted could possibly be fitted to this building. So the next one is just an isolation tap in the middle there is an isolation tap under either a laundry or a kitchen or in a bathroom. So some apartments might have three or four separate cold water isolation taps. It was a way that the water network was designed when um, that building was built, that um, each individual um, point in the house, a kitchen will be on one side, a bathroom on the other side, a non-suite or a laundry somewhere else. So the water stack just runs straight up that building. The um, third example there is where um, the, um, it's inside the apartment under a kitchen sink. We've gone on the left here, we've got the, um, the hot water meter, um, gas meter valve, gas reader meter valve. And on the right down the bottom, that's the isolation point for the cold water. Now in between is an older style thermostatic mixing valve. And again, as I said, that's a, a fail point for uh, a lot of um, units because of their age, and that's quite an old one there. So the one on the right, you'll find in apartments. The one in the middle, you'll find in the apartments. The one on the left-hand side will be in the common area on each floor. So water pressure. So water pre pressure impacts residents and the infrastructure. So it's on an as per floor basis. So different floors will have different mixes of pressure depending on how the infrastructure within that building's put together. You can see on the gauge there, we've got 800 kPa of pressure um, in, on this particular instance. So at 800 kPa, that voids the warranty on most tapware. So most tapware that you buy now is maximum 500 kPa, otherwise you void the warranty. That, that, that's for a number of reasons. So they can manufacture it to a lower standard perhaps, but also, you know, it's more, more um, likely to leak. The higher the pressure, the more it's likely to leak. So when you've got high pressure, it puts pressures on pipes, hoses, um, Everything, every every little thing in, within the building, even the washing machine, solenoid valves, dishwasher solenoid valve. So high pressure is poor, is, is not good to have within the building. And similarly, if you've got um, one of the uh, different hot water, your hot water and your cold water is a bit different pressure. If it's more than 100 kilo kPa difference in pressure, you have a real problems getting that right mix right when you're trying to have a shower because it is just makes it very difficult because of the, the pressure difference. It makes it even worse when you're trying to make a, a building water efficient and put it in a water efficient shower because the flow restrictor in a shower to keep it to nine litres a minute or less um, creates more problems with mixing. So where there is a, um, so where there is um, a big difference, a really big major difference in um, pressure, we would recommend that that would be sorted out first before you try to make that building water efficient because it's just gonna get, um, you, you're gonna have very unhappy customers because they're gonna be nearly impossible to get a, a, a good temperature in your shower without it being really finicky. Tony, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we've yep. just got about five more minutes, I reckon. So we all right. Okay. Just noticing so, the time there. All right. No problems. If you want to go to the next one, that's just a quick example okay. of the differences in pressures within one building that I did as pressure map survey through. And you can see the ones down the end there, it was just not really possible to get a good shower. And you can see the, the pressure's going up over 1200 kPa. It's, it's just way off the scale. So... And then again, with saving water, there's a relationship again between water and energy. For the dollars you're saving in water, you're also merely saving similar costs in energy. Let's go to keep going along. So we'll start talking about, is my building water efficient? So with Sydney, we have a bench, within Sydney Water, we've got a benchmark and it's per bedroom per day. Um, per person per day would be brilliant, but it's very hard to get that type of um, level of 
um, detail in a strata building, especially in a larger one when this occupancy is always changing. So we high anything higher than 300 litres per bedroom per day is considered high. Typical is two to 300. Best practice is anything less than 200. And um, unachieved target, as we say, say there, is, is less than 130. So if you've got anything between 200 and 130, you're going really well. Next slide. This is just some benchmarking analysis and a bit of a scatter plot of where buildings are, a cohort of buildings are on the number of bedrooms. We'll just keep going along. So how do you calculate your benchmark? So if you get a water bill, it'll have on there how many days that bill's for and the total consumption. So if, if you get that information for the last quarter, four quarters, you can add all that up, divide it by the total number of days, um, to, and then divide it by the number of bedrooms, and you can come up basically with that benchmark. So I've been talking to you long, we better keep moving along. We can get, go into more detail in that in a moment. So with Waters Fix Strata, um, so with Water Fix, it was a plumbing service we established back in 1999. We've done more than half a million properties and we've done about 15 strata buildings, big strata buildings, um, we do leak repairs, we replace showers, taps, we repair toilet leaks or replace toilets. They're the primary focus. So we've carefully adapted that um, uh, original residential single home dwelling to suit apartments. So we've got a um, you know an efficient, accurate quote per, um, process. We've got sophisticated multi-channel, multilingual customer engagement campaign. And it's turnkey project management. So we go in, we'll do a quote. Once that quote's agreed to, then we will take care of everything else. That means getting access into apartments, um, getting all the plumbers there, getting it all happening on time, all the safety, everything's taken care of once that's signed up to. The next one. So we also have a finance option available for eligible buildings, depending on where they land on that benchmark. And with that um, finance option, it's basically you're paying the same amount of money you would pay, you were paying before we've come in and done the work. So we come in, we do the work, we achieve a water saving on average is 30%. So when, when we finish the job, we look at the water usage post and basically, the, the savings pay for the work we do. This is where I was gonna get Tonya to jump in and, and talk if you wanna have a quick talk, chat about this, Tonya. Yeah, sure. Um, we organize the access for all the plumbers um, into each apartment. So that involves basically getting in contact with each of the residents uh, in each of the apartments to make sure that either they're going to be home or they're going to allow us, give us a key, provide key access or with a neighbour or a friend, or we organise with the real estate agent uh, on occasion that happens. So we just provide a dedicated phone and email number and email address put up notices throughout the building, notices under each door for all the residents to respond and those who haven't responded. And we do allow this flexibility with the timing. We usually stagger it so that we work through a building and we do certain floors at a time. However, if someone on the other floor that wasn't scheduled for that day needs it that particular day, we're certainly able to move it around. And when the plumbers are actually there on the ground, where they're working with the plumbers and the residents to make sure everyone's getting the jobs done and getting through them. And then we follow up on any callbacks. And that's the process that we follow in the building. So back to you, Tony. Yeah, so with, with all the buildings, we, we survey all the customers as well. And we get, we've been getting, on average, we get 9 four out of 10 on the customer experience, how how they feel about how the um, the service is delivered and how, how 
the results, etc. So I've got here just a, a one a larger building, one of the earlier larger buildings we did. It's 152 apartments. It was doing 575 litres per bedroom per day. After the service, it went down to 379. Um, we reduced leaks in the building by 73% and we had a 35% overall reduction in the total water use. Not sure how well you can see that graph there. And for that building, we saved them 40, that $45,000 a year in water. The next slide is a smaller building that we did quite some time ago. It was only nine apartments. We did taps, showers, leaks, and we replaced toilets. Um, we'd like to put this one up because we actually did this one quite a few years ago back in, uh, can I see, no, I can't see the dates on this one, sorry, but it was quite a few years ago back in about 2015 and it still got the same water savings that we achieved then. We expect the water savings, as I said, everything wears out over time, but we expect the water savings to to last up to 10 years. So here's some of the typical results where different buildings, where here's one building here, we've got a 38% reduction and $74,000 a year. The next one on the right is 32% reduction and $61,000 a year. That's, this is just in water, these costs. This is not allowing, um, counting the energy cost as well which is again, as I said before, it's, it's really quite significant. So half an hour didn't quite seem long enough, um, but if you want more information, you can email us at waterfixstrata at sydneywater.com or give us a call on the 1800 number. And you can also get some more information from our website. So just quickly, what how the process would work is that you would come to us with your bedroom numbers, either an email or whatever, and or a phone call. And then we can then do a benchmark on your building. And then we can tell you whether your building is already water efficient or not. And then if it's not, we can then possibly offer you the water fix service. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony, and sorry to, to hurry you off at the end, but that was okay. really fantastic. And if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. I will uh, move on to Chris now, and then at the end, we'll hopefully have five minutes for question time. So I'll let Chris share her screen. Thank you, Tony. Just a second. I'll just set up my little pointer. Can you hear me okay? Start my video. Yes, it's great. Thank you. Yes, I can. Okay, dokie. Okay. Um, okay. Um, just just before I get into this, I just I just think um, you know we really need to congratulate Sydney Water for all the work that they've done um, in this space because you know living in apartments we're often forgot about everyone works on houses and and other things and governments except councils um, tend to forget about it so Sydney Water you know for them to have come up with such great analysis of what's happening in apartment buildings and to also then come up with a targeted program recognizing where the obstacles are I think really needs to be applauded and it, it's leading in Australia um, and they've got such proven results now so that there's no risk in this either so I think we, they've done a great job, probably better than many organisations around the place. Um, I just want to address a couple of sides of um, on the governance and management side in apartment buildings when we're looking at how to, to take action to make our buildings more water efficient and how to keep them um, water efficient once, once we do that initial work up front. Um, so, hold on, that's not working, is it? Okay, so just um, just to clear a few myths that might misunderstandings that might be out there before we get into it, because a lot of people think that that their apartments are 
have individual water meters because they get a, a, a essentially a rates charge or a service charge from Sydney Water. But most of our buildings, um, particularly anything built prior to 2014, we just have a single meter for the entire building. So that covers common area use and every single apartment. So the owner's corporation um, is the one that actually gets the bill for water consumption. And you'll see that up the top of the screen there, just this, this bit up here, oops, uh, sorry. My laser wasn't working. Let me set that again. Okay, so this bit up here is what the owners corporation gets and they pay for water consumption. But then every owner gets their quarterly bill from Sydney Water and that's the fixed charges, right? That's just a service charge. So a lot of people think because they get a bill every quarter then they're individually metered and that's not the case. So that's why we really need to look at addressing buildings as a, as a whole, because there's a single metre there. Um, new buildings from 2014 onwards, late 2014 onwards, Sydney Water required them to be have individual metres for cold water in apartments. And so what happens there, if you're lucky enough to be um, in, a, in a newer building like that, then um, each owner gets, gets the bill from Sydney Water, not, not any tenants, but each owner gets them. And owners can pass on charges for, for water consumption and the service charges uh, to their tenants, provided um, that there's water efficient fixtures and fittings, right? So um, if you haven't got that, then um, it, you can't pass it on. And that's in the Res Residential Tenancies Act. But most of our buildings still, as we know, just have one single water meter for the entire building. So if we look at understanding that most of the consumption is inside our apartments, um, and yet that's essentially under private control of, of the owner and the resident there, but that's that the owner's corporation is paying the bill for this, then you know, we, we have to think about, well, how can we get people to have water efficient fixtures and fittings in the building? And, and you know, over time people will go, um, and so Sydney Water's come up with a great program where they take away all the problems. Um, but if you don't get their finance option as well and want to look at doing it yourself, um, and there could be a bit of upfront cost to that. So some of the arguments go, you know, well, why can't we just appeal to people to take responsibility? Um, and we know that's an easy way to, <laughs> an easy way to think, but it, it actually has no effect whatsoever. We've, we've got to deal with human nature. Other people have suggested, well, can't we put a bylaw in there to, to mandate that people have water efficient fixtures and fittings in their apartments? Um, so that's, that's an easy thing from an owner's corporation's perspective. But again, it's not effective in achieving anything because then how do, you, how do you monitor that? How do you make sure that people are doing it? So we've still got the same problem. Um, another option is, you know, for the owner's corporation, since the owner's corporation is already paying for the water, right? Um, and, and Sydney Water has proven results about how much money can be saved. So it makes sense for the owners corporation to pay for this upfront if they don't take the finance option with, with Sydney Water. Um, so some buildings tried saying, well, the owners corporation will pay, but the individual owners, you organise for the work to be done in your apartment. That's, you know, easy, but it's still not effective because you're still dealing with individuals and human nature. So the only real way to address this on a building wide basis is if the owners corporation takes control, pays for stuff if it's necessary to pay for it and organises it. Um, and the beauty now with what Sydney is Water has done with Waterfit Strata is they'll do all the organisation as well, because the hardest thing you know, fixing the thing is really easy. The hardest thing is actually getting access to apartments in the first place and getting access to every single apartment over, you know, a few days or, or however long it would take for your size building. And that's where Sydney Water and, and Tonya with Strider Answers have got this great partnership to take all the hassle away. Um, and it's just a no brainer now. And it's really the only effective way. And it's now an easy way because Sydney Water's taken all the hassle out. Buildings did it a while ago and it, 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 was, it was a bit of, of a trauma sometimes, but you don't even have to worry about that now. And then some people, um, you know, you've always got people that will come up with some objection about why to do, why you shouldn't do this, or if the owner's corporation has to pay for it, why are we paying for it? Um, and first of all, people say, well, I'm already paying for water, but they're not, they're only paying the service charge because <laughs> they don't have their own meter. Um, 
Some people say, well, we're in a new building and we don't have to worry about it. Well, actually, you do need to think about it still and look at your, um, your whether your building is war efficient or not, because as we know, we have this little thing called defects. Um, and defects also manifest in um, the fittings that, that developers have been known to put in new buildings. So, you know, you, you can't buy, uh, uh, you can't go out and buy a shower head that's not efficient today or, you know, taps. There's rules about all this stuff and minimum water standards that things have that when we purchase things retail. But it seems like developers can, you know, buy lots of things overseas, um, bulk purchases overseas. And so Sydney Water has found out even in new buildings, we've got new buildings going up that are supposed to have water efficient um, showers and taps and all that kind of stuff, and they're not. So it doesn't matter the age of your building, you still need to look at this. Um, people are going, well, I'm efficient in my apartment. Uh, why should, you know, my levies go towards paying for fixing up something in somebody else's apartment? And on one hand, you know, that's, that's fair enough. But on the other hand, your levies are paying for everybody's overconsumption. So, you know, once you fix it, everybody benefits. So um, we also have this thing, um, and I think it's a stigma from you know, the early days when, when Sydney Waters program went out a couple of decades ago, because I mean, the old shower heads were, some of them were pretty ugly, you know, you, you got a trickle. Um, so, but, but, but things have certainly changed, you know, things have changed over a couple of decades, but there's still that bit of a stigma there. And as, you know, as Tony said, from those pictures that you look at, you don't really know by looking at something. So you know, whether it's a $6 shower head or a $600 shower head, they're all water efficient these days, right? Um, and people are getting good results. Most of the problems come because of, of different pressure zones in buildings that Tony's already talked about, but Sydney Water now understand that in great detail as well. So when they get out and do your whole building, they, they've thought about all the things and they've experienced all the things up front. So, so they're aware of any possible things that could go wrong and make allowance for that, particularly pressure zones in buildings. Um, a lot of people think that the problems with commercial lots as well, um, particularly, uh, you know, because a lot of our buildings now have retail and commercial lots on the ground floor. I think um, Tony or Sydney Waters recognised, you know, they ask you whether you've got an Asian restaurant uh, or whether you've got a laundromat. So potentially those types of commercial operations can have a more significant impact. But um, overall, the commercial lots have very little impact on the total building consumption. Even hairdressers, you know, I, I was in a building that had a couple of hairdressers and we submitted them and I was just staggered to see how little water they used. Um, so there's only a couple of types of businesses, again, that may impact your, your build overall consumption. Um, a lot of people say that there's just a lot of myths around there now. And I, and I think in the early days, there were problems and understanding more, in more detail about how things worked in apartment buildings, but Sydney Water's got it covered now. There's, there's very little that they don't know. Every time I hear Tony speak, I learn something more from the last time. Um, so you're in good hands there now. Um, and it's not expensive to do this stuff when, if, even if you end up paying for it yourself from an owner's corporation's perspective, your paybacks are really, really, really quick. You know, a couple of years max, but we're seeing buildings that get paybacks in, in like six months. So, you know, and, and one, once that's done, these, these are annual savings that you're talking about, you know, um, and so it's, a, it's turned out to be a big chunk. And, uh, and there's enough evidence out there now to go that this stuff works. Um, Sydney Water would not be offering a finance option where they fund it up front and get their money back, you know, um, based on the savings that you make. They would not be doing that. They're pretty conservative. They would not be doing that if they did not have confidence in the results. Um, and there's enough data around now over the years to say that this stuff works. So um, when it comes to, to different types of approvals that you might need to, to do this kind of stuff in your building, um, if you, in theory, if you take the water fix strata finance option, right, where it costs nothing to do it up front, certainly so water comes in, uh, you just keep paying the same amount of money until the work's paid off and then you benefit from the, from the savings that have been made. In theory, you're not spending any owner's corporation's funds, you're not changing common property, um, if you're just working in apartments um, and 
So in theory, it's something that the strata committee could approve. But most people, because of the scale of it, tend to take it to a general meeting and there's nothing wrong with that as well, just for a surety. There's, there's you know, never anything wrong with taking anything to a general meeting. Um, if, if you're spending owners' corporations' funds on personal property, that's definitely something that needs to go to a general meeting. But the business case is really good. You know, you're spending a, a relatively small amount of money up front for, for ongoing annual savings that are quite large. So there's, a, there's an example motion there if you wanted to do that of um, what you could do if you're funding this yourself. And um, another thing that you might wanna think about which some buildings do, and they do it both for water efficiency and energy efficiency sometimes, and it's particularly when you've got a, you know, an active strata committee and they're trusted by the owners corporation and um, you know, is to get pre-approval for these things. So that as you take different initiatives over time, to improve not just water, but other, you know, waste, energy, all that kind of stuff. Get pre-approval up front so that you don't have to keep going back to a general meeting each time. So there's just a few options and some example motions that you could use there to do that. Um, the other thing that that has a, has a big impact uh, on, on water consumption is overcrowding. Um, and, you know, there are certain areas around town that, that have serious overcrowding problems, be they um, lots of students or um, backpackers and things like that. So this is inside apartment stuff, you know, 14 people living in a two bedroom apartment, that's 14 showers a day instead of a few showers a day, that's significant. So this, the, when the um, last uh, update to the Act came out in 2015, um, they recognised how significant overcrowding was and, and gave allowance for owners' corporations to enact bylaws to limit the number of people that could reside in apartments. Um, and they also specifically increased the fines um, associated with the breach of those bylaws quite significantly because, you know, it certainly in, in, um, increases water consumption, but it's, it's, a, it's a big safety issue as well to have too many people in there. So um, if, you haven't, if you have an overcrowding problem and you haven't got a bylaw in there, seriously think about putting a bylaw in there. And thankfully there are a number of strata lawyers out there now who are realizing that, you know, because a lot of them, they have the same bylaw and they pull it off the shelf and they charge you 600 or a thousand dollars or something. Some of, the, some of them are getting a bit smarter and saying, well, look, let's just put bylaws out there that people need which we can generally have generic bylaws for different situations. So there's a, there's a link there when you get the slides of, of, a, of quite a good overcrowding bylaw um, template to, to limit the number of occupants in a building um, at a very reasonable price. Chris, just doing a time check. We've got about two more minutes. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Um, a uh, quick one, there's a, um, just to let you know, there's a bill going through Parliament right now, it's been hijacked by pets a bit, um, but it's introducing a new type of, of resolution and it's a sustainability infrastructure resolution. So if you want to make changes to common property to deal with energy efficiency, water efficiency, waste management, um, a few things on the list there, they've reduced the voting threshold. Um, so that's quite significant as we start to move to more sustainability initiatives in our buildings. Um, and that uh, reduces the threshold from a special resolution, which was not more than 25% against, to not more than 50% against. And just a, a word that most people know when you're talking about percentages, you're not talking about percentage of all owners in the building. You're talking that the percentages apply to those people who are present and eligible to vote at the meeting. So in some cases that could come down to one person um, could get a resolution through. And very quickly, um, once you get the work done, the important thing is to work out, you know, if your building is not more efficient, get it all fixed up all at once, get it out of the way, keep the savings, but then you've got to be proactive about keeping on top of it. And particularly with leaks, because leaks can happen at any time. Um, and so these are just a few examples of what some buildings do. So leaks can be really significant and they're really costly. So, you know, some particularly larger buildings, you know, they email their residents regularly saying, have you got leaks? Um, and they'll organise a plumber to come in for one day or however, once a month or once a quarter or something like that. And the owners corporation will pay for it, right? Because most of the time, 
these aren't significant causes, right? If there's any major work, then the costs will get passed back to the owner of that apartment. But most of the time the owner's corporation will pay for a plumber to come in and work on fixing leaks around the place for a day because buildings have worked out that it's still cheaper to pay for the labour of a plumber up front than it is to pay for the excess water charges that are gonna result from those leaks. Um, other places do annual inspections of apartments. You know, you've got to do a capital works fund plan and there's anyway, and there's common property that you can't even see from it inside apartments. So it, ha it will help with general planning, um, but also you can check out to see if there's leaks and, you know, do, a te do, do some tests to see if things are, if the flow rates are still low or people haven't changed things around. So there's an opportunity to do that. Um, other buildings put out reminder notices. It's interesting, you know, take sh shorter showers, um, you know, all, all the little tips about saving water in your home. Um, people forget about it. And it's interesting when, and, and it's seen because buildings that are monitoring their consumption, they put out a reminder notice and it just occasionally, and, and people just, it's a prompt and people start paying attention again, because we're just dealing with human nature. And again, others that have more um, automated monitoring systems put up reports and graphical stuff on the notice boards and everything, just to give people a prompt of, of what's happening there. And they are all things that have proven results. Um, yeah, so I've rushed through that, but there you go. I think that's the end of that one. I'll stop sharing that. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really wonderful and uh, yeah, really helpful to give the, the picture behind objections and, and how to resolve those and different ways to get it through your strata committee. Um, I've just got, uh, we have two questions, so I might just uh, read them out on behalf of uh, Linda Rosenman. Um, she asks, she is on the strata committee for a six unit, 15 bedroom, 1930s building. There has been an intermittent leak that is damaging the apartments below that plumbers have not been able to find and it's driving up water co costs but also causing damage. Can Sydney Water help? Tony, is that something that you deal with? Yes, we can. Great. Um, it's, it's another really important part in, in uh, apartment buildings. Um, we just completed uh, an apartment building with about 154 units and they still had quite a high base flow. And yes, we've been, we've been back there and found a concealed leak in there. So we actually have a specific service for concealed leaks called Waterfix Concealed Leaks as well. Um, you can find the number on the... 1-800 number on the website and uh, give us a call. Um, finding concealed leaks is a very specialist um, part of plumbing, very specialised. There's not a lot of great operators out there. So they found the best one we can find in Sydney. Um, if you've got a concealed leak, we will find it for you. Great. Thank you, Tony. So, Linda, if you just email Tony or myself, I can pass that on to Tony. Nathan Hag has asked... Can apartments with a single meter be retrofitted with meters for each unit? Uh, okay, so back in my presentation, that I've now got my other computer working properly here, but back in my presentation, it depends on the setup of the building. If you've got um, a, an isolation point that's just in your apartment, normally you might have three. So it's extremely difficult to retrofit um, water meters in those apartments. And it's really not very cost effective either. It's not impossible. Anything is actually possible, but the cost to do so is really quite prohibitive. If you have, um, if you have the other manifold type, if your building was maybe about 15 years old, it may have that manifold in the common area. Those ones are quite easy, are much more practical to um, retrofit meters into. Wonderful. Uh, well, it's. I've just noticed we're just on perfect timing there. So I'll, I'll, oh, we've got lots more questions, but what I might do is, uh, yeah, we might email around some of the responses to those emails. Uh, just very quickly, there's an issue about the temperature of the hot water taking a while to heat up uh, and 
yeah, a question about rainwater tanks being so we might, uh, yeah, we'll send out some follow up information. I'm just conscious of time, but thank you all for attending this webinar and to give up your lunch break. We really encourage you to get in touch with Tony. Uh, you can do that directly with Tony or via myself. We'll be promoting uh, Water Fix for Strata not only in Waverley but also in Willara and Randwick councils through the Regional Environment Program uh, over the next few months. So uh, we're really excited about this initiative and hope that as many buildings can participate as possible in our area. So thank you, Chris, for your time. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Tonya. And thank you, Nicola, for behind the scenes. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you all soon. <laughs>